Thank you so much for joining us here in the KEXP studios. I'm Cheryl Waters, and today we're joined by Naima Bach. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. So wonderful to have you here. It's and wonderful to be here. So you, you and these wonderful musicians sound good just when you're tuning up. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear these beautiful songs. You have a new album, Giant Palm, that came out last summer on Sub Pop Records. And it looks like you're going to share some new songs with us today as well. Oh, well, we're doing mostly songs from the album and one song, one song, an old folk song that we're doing as well. Wonderful. I can't wait to hear it. It's Naima Bach live on KEXP. One, two, three, one, two.
So beautiful, that was so nice. <laughs> um, so the next song we're going to play is a song by someone called Cyril Tawney. It's a folk song, like a sea song about the Royal Navy.
One for the tide and in there you'll stay And you're right when you say Nothing's changed
You've put me in a trance. <laughs> We're live here in the KEXP studios with Naima Bach. That was absolutely gorgeous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Naima, you've been immersed in music, it sounds like, your entire life. And it sounds to me from reading interviews with you that your childhood was just a fertile environment for music discovery and you have such an enchanting voice. Did, did you start listening to music in the home and maybe performing or singing when you were young? Um, yeah, I think, well, I'll turn this mic away. <laughs> I think I, um, I was from, I remember I was six and I, the first record I got was uh, Gorillaz, Demon Day, actually. And I was still living in Brazil at that time. And I remember we would go to this CD shop and there would be like loads of CDs and I'd, I picked that one. And that was actually the first which is funny kind of obviously I was all the way in Brazil and it wasn't a Brazilian album but <clears throat> that was the first album that sort of that made me want to write songs I used to like write them in my head a little bit when I was a kid um, and then I came they came back to England and they used to run these kind of community things where they would put little kids you know in bands and we would be playing like gigs they'd make us play gigs so I think the first gig I did I was eight or something and it was terrifying and we did and we covered we covered some really stupid songs <laughs> well you in addition to modern music you're really drawn it sounds like to that traditional folk music that that song you just did funnel line was so beautiful oh, what about you. those traditional songs do you love so much I think it's lovely that you can bring new life into them and keep them alive yeah well I think I think for me, the call of the traditional songs was more... Actually, it was less to do with my love of music and more to do with my love of history. And so <clears throat> I liked... I just kind of liked doing, you know, like a lot of amateur history research and I started a degree in archaeology. And then, um, and then folk music had always been something that I listened to and I think it was only in the last few years that I really looked into the stories behind them. And... The biggest part for me of why they're important to me in, in a sort of, in the sense that they touch me emotionally is because it's, a, you know, it's the voices of people that, of whose history hasn't been written down, but it's been sung and it's been carried through that way. And there's just something so, um, you know, so kind of heart-based about that for it to be sung through time rather than written in books and things. And it's an alternative. It's an emotional history. And most of those songs are emotional and talking about, you know, sometimes they're quite dramatic. And so that's for me, it kind of, it's, it, that's the important part of it for me. Yeah. Just in this short conversation, we've talked about a lot of music with different sounds. And of course, when you were very young, you were in the indie sort of punk rock band, Goat Girl. Mm -hmm. And then last summer you released this beautiful album, Giant Palm on Sub Pop Records, which just incorporates a melange of gorgeous sounds and styles with all the love of those different styles of music and having performed different kinds of music. What was it that you wanted this album to say musically? Hmm, I think um, that's a good question. I think that this album for me was something that I wanted, I wanted it to be calming for people and a, a place, my favorite albums are calm, safe places. And I've grown up in cities my whole life and so I think I've looked specifically for maybe quieter music in order to, to listen to and to do that, you know, and so I think that now you asking that question I haven't thought about it before but I think that was what I wanted to give people was just a kind of you know like a sigh and a, a place that they could just sort of be without um without being in like too overstimulated yeah well, see, speaking of calm places, I know in every interview I've ever read with you, everyone asks you about this, but I have to ask it because it's my favorite pastime, which is walking. You do a lot of walking. I walk yeah. hours a day and I actually don't distract myself with music or podcasts, even though I, I love those things when I walk. And I was so delighted to hear that you do that as well. And then a lot of the songs come to you during mm. that space. And you mentioned that you grew up in, in big cities. I mean, do you walk in cities? Do you walk wherever you are? I uh, no, I actually don't walk in cities that much, but I, I kind of do a, I'll go, I'll try and go once every two weeks 
somewhere outside of London and just do a really I think I like like once I get into the routine and rhythm of walking for hours you know it's it's really something else for me and like I kind of try and do you know like 15 to 20 kilometer walks every every couple of weeks but mostly um I go away onto the the Camino de Santiago every year and just have that sort of you know like how people I guess some people go on meditation retreats and stuff and I kind of do that because my mind would go crazy if I went on a meditation retreat so walking's really the thing for me that yeah that gets me into that meditative space and um and it's hugely important to not for me to not listen to music as well because then I think David Byrne said something about that in his music, uh, in his book, How Music Works, where he said that listening to too much music on headphones can distract you from the songs that will just come up in your head as you're walking around or driving or whatever you're doing, you know. So when I was, whenever I've walked the pilgrimage, I've tried to just kind of have a clear, like, no podcast, no music, um, which can be super boring sometimes. <laughs> But and, then songs come. So. And do you keep those ideas of songs that come in your head or do you write them down or do you put them on a on a phone or how does that work? No, I try and I try and do the um the thing where if, if I don't remember that if I don't remember it then it's not worth keeping. And so I just if it comes I I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember it and then if I lose it it's lost, you know, but if it's if it stays I'll kind of keep singing it in my head for a few days or whatever. Yeah. I'd love to talk about how Giant Palm came together. The recording process sounds like something that may be a situation that will never come together in that same way again. It sounds like a pretty unique time. Yeah. Can you talk about that, getting ready for writing the songs, getting ready for recording and actually coming together? Yeah. Yeah, kind of, you're right about it. It was very, it was, so it was, in, it was in September 2020 that we recorded it. And um, it was just at the a kind of, respite part of the lockdown where people were allowed out a little bit more um, but we still during the recording we still kind of kept the precautions and put up sheets and stuff especially when we were recording the choir because we had about 30 people in there um, but we were I guess due to the lockdown we were gifted with three months before actually recording the songs to be able to just go over them and work with them and sit with them. And so me and my my producer, Joel Burton, we just did that. We pretty much spent every day together just going over these songs that by that point had been somewhat old for me, like maybe a couple of years or old already. And then we went over them and um, made a very... We knew we had one week in the studio, and so he made a very strict timetable of everything and when everyone was going to come in and everything like that. And Ollie was playing on it as well. He was here, Oliver Hamilton. And, um, and Holly also sang on it. And so we kind of got all of our friends, basically, and luckily people were free, which is also something that might is not so easy now because everyone is working and has other commitments, but... It was it was actually a really it was a really beautiful time and that that seven days was really special and and it sounds a bit reductive but I like the organized the organized part of it was helpful in kind of keeping it a special thing there was no chaos or uncertainty about what we were doing it all felt very very um, considered you know before we went in. Yeah. It's just incredible to think that all those people were available and you've done yeah. some shows where you've had quite a number of people on stage with you mm. um, reproducing the songs. But I have to say, it's really kind of incredible that so many people were on the songs on the record and that you can so beautifully represent these songs just by yourself or with one or two other musicians. Were mm. you thinking in the studio when you kept adding all those people, how am I going to tour with this record? No, because I didn't really expect to tour with it. So I, I, I'd just started university. Straight after we finished the record, I decided to... Well, I'd already enrolled, but I was starting university. So I was thinking, well, this has been a lovely thing to have done, you know, and then and so and that's it. I'll just guess I'll just keep it in my pocket for a couple of years and see what happens then. But, um, but my friend and manager, Josh was very adamant that we send it around to people. So I kind of, in terms of the live situation, I didn't really think about um, what we were going to do until we started getting offered gigs. And then 
we got the band together who played on the record. So that was Cassidy Hansen on drums, um, Clem Appleby on bass and uh, Maytal Wegman on saxophone, Joel on <laughs> keys and Ollie on violin. And we, we started um, touring together a bit. And then, and then with support, like slots and stuff I had to do quite a lot on my own but it was really helpful for me singing to have to face doing it on my own you know it was like a really big jump because I had to just kind of I had to somehow fill a room just with myself and the guitar and then later on thankfully Ollie came and joined me but you know it was it was a really um actually like a scary but beautiful learning process for me to try and do it myself and I think it was healing in a way because there's, although despite the beauty of having so many people on a record, there's always going to be a sense of kind of like giving your baby away, you know, and it's like, I don't know why that happens. But when I was playing on my own, it kind of felt like I was, I had it back a little bit, you know, and they were back to, back to me. And so, yeah, it was in that way, it was really good. Well, it's so lovely to have you here today at KEXP Thank playing you. these songs. Giant Palm, so beautiful. It's out on Sub Pop Records. And we thank you all for coming in today. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Cheryl. And thank you, Ollie and Holly. <laughs> and thanks to all of our wonderful listeners for making sessions like this possible. We are listener supported. You can go to kexp.org anytime to learn more about us or to make a gift to make more of these sessions happen. And again, we're so happy to have Naima Bach live on KEXP Seattle. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.